let's all stand. flesh will fail you, you dare not trust your own. And that's true, isn't it? But we have an everlasting arm that's so strong that he can hold up the whole world of Christianity and take care of every one of us. Amen? All right. Good to see you this morning. And uh, look around and I see a number of guests with us today. We're so glad that you're here and we trust that you'll make yourself at home. I'd like to meet you and say hello to you if I could. Some of you have already met this morning, but some of you I have not. And it's good to have you uh, with our news family here this morning. I want to ask you to be praying for uh, Sister Tila Collins. Uh, many of you are aware of her situation. Please keep her in prayer. Brother Daryl Dale may come home this afternoon, uh, waiting for Gail to call me and to let me know, but he'll probably come home this afternoon, they feel. Uh, Brother John Sexton, of course, pray for him as he recovers. And Edwin, uh, the viewing for your sister-in-law is four this afternoon, is that right? Uh, so pray for the fa- four o'clock. All right. And yes. Most of them don't know that. Who he's talking about is Mary Sue Wadford. He used to live right next door. Uh, they've been a member of this church for years. He used to sing in the choir. His wife, which is Edwin's sister-in-law, passed away yesterday. That's Ricky Wadford's mother. Uh, most of the older people know who I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. But it's Wadford's. All right. Keep those folk in prayer. Um, Sue and I got back into Miami yesterday morning and was met by an old college friend, uh, Brother Freddie Crow, missionary for over 20 years in Nicaragua and Costa Rica, and has just come off the mission field, uh, well, if you want to say that, but he's come to Miami and has a Spanish ministry in Miami. Of course, if you know Miami, uh, mostly Spanish-speaking anyway, Uh, and uh, he has a church there. And we got to see the church where he's ministering and to be with him in the afternoon. And I want you to pray for him. His name is Freddie Crow, and getting a new Spanish work going there uh, in that uh, Miami area. And I would appreciate, and he would appreciate your prayers for him. Uh, he's 60 years old, and uh, I'll not go into detail, but for helping others out, uh, he has now at age 60 a four-year-old and a three-year-old that they're going to be raising. Can you imagine that? A young man like me, that'd be tough on me. Uh, But to be a missionary and then all of that, so I would appreciate your prayers uh, for Freddie and his wife. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's ask his blessings to be on our service today. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day that you've allowed us to live. Thank you for your marvelous grace and mercy. And thank you, Heavenly Father, for saving us We thank you for giving us everlasting life, and we thank you that you understand us. Uh, Sometimes our best friend, sometimes our family may not understand us, uh, but you understand us. 
And we're so thankful that you know our uprising and our downsetting. Uh, you know all about us. And help us to be just honest with you because there's nothing we can hide. Uh, there's nothing we can cover up. Uh, everything is open before you. And to help us to walk uh, clearly before you. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that uh, we have the privilege of coming to you when we fail. And asking forgiveness and then move on for your glory. Now I pray for those that are sick, that are facing physical maladies at this time. Give recovery. We think of Brother Sexton this morning and is always here. Uh, always faithful to the house of God, but recovering from surgery. Bless him and be with him. Ask that you'll encourage Tila and her family this morning. And we pray that you'll be with Dwayne. Give him great comfort and strength. And uh, Lord, we pray that you'll be with Daryl. Uh, pray that he will be able to come home and that he'll get his strength back. We're so glad that he's been able to come out to church recently. But we pray that you'll encourage his heart today and be with him in a very special way. We pray for Sister Edwina and the family there and the home going of this loved one. We pray that you'll be near them and close to them in a very special way. Thank you for our guests that are with us today. They have seen fit to make it in to the house of God at Moose Baptist Church today. We thank you for that. We pray that they will be welcomed warmly and heartily. We pray that they will sense the Savior's presence and the joy of the Lord. We ask that you will bless us as we continue to move forward. Uh, very important uh, day after day that we serve you with all of our heart. Uh, we pray for Vicki and Dwight uh, as they've gone to Hickory uh, in the situation there. We pray that you'll be with them and bless them. And uh, we ask that as we move forward this week that we'll move forward with your presence uh, in our lives as never before. Now bless this service, the music, the preaching of the word, the fellowship. May it all resound to your glory and to your honor. This prayer I ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Be seated, please. Good morning once again. I have a couple of announcements I just want to share with you very quickly. Ladies Retreat coming up next Thursday. I've been told to share with you that you need to have your balance in this evening for that. So ladies, if you are taking part in that, please be prepared to have your balance for the retreat this evening. Also, immediately following the service tonight, we'll have our True Love Commitment Time uh, for our young people that went with us on the retreat and are making that commitment to save themselves from the one God's prepared for them and to follow God's way rather than the world's way. So we look forward to that. Also, if you're visiting with us today, if you received a bulletin that looks like this, if you just find this part right here and fill that out and drop in the offering plate so we can have a record of your visit today. Find somebody this morning. Let's stand and shake some hands and welcome folks to the house.
All the ushers are coming and we're making ready to receive the Lord's tithes and offerings. Turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Will you be the one that will make a difference in someone else's life, that will always be there, that will be a beaming light, that will be salt upon this earth? I hope that you will. Thank you, choir, uh, for that number. I trust that you'll be back tonight at 6 for our prayer time. Our ladies and our men meet and pray together, and I don't think we should overlook that time. It's good to pray silently and privately. It's good to pray in your closet. But it's good for God's people to come together and pray with one another. And then in the evening service tonight, we're in chapter 9 of the book of Revelation. When hell comes to earth. 
And all of you have studied the Scriptures concerning what the Bible says about hell. But when you come to chapter 9 of Revelation, you discover that there is an infernal abyss that is in the depths of hell where people who have left this life without the Lord do not go. They're in hell, but they do not go to this infernal abyss. The pit, the Bible calls it, because there are chained the most wicked and evil demons, fallen angels, the world has ever seen or known. And in chapter 9, we'll discover that this abyss will be opened and these angels will be let loose upon the earth during the tribulation period. Hell will literally come to earth. And what happens during that time? It's one of the most awful times uh, of history. Things will be uh, progressively worse. And we'll see that tonight, God willing, in the book of Revelation chapter 9. Now, in Mark chapter 15, Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, a time to be silent. A time to be silent. Verse 1, And straightway in the morning the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and uh, bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. And Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. Look at verse 3 again. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Have there been times in your life when you wished you had said nothing? You would be better off. Others would be better off. Uh, you would not have stinging memories. Uh, you would not be reminded of speaking out a turn. Uh, speaking too harshly, speaking too quickly, uh, perhaps saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, maybe even speaking out and hurting someone that you love. Maybe the person that you love the most. Or perhaps there were times that we said something and acted in ways that brought reproach uh, upon the name of Christ, and the Spirit of God pricked our heart. And we thought about that, and we wish we'd said nothing. You said in the audience this morning, and I stand here before you, and perhaps we can go back through the years and we can think of an occasion so real to us when we think about it, so cutting when we think about it, so bitter when we think about it, and we just simply say, I wish I'd said nothing. Now, you may have been forgiven, and it may be in the past, but yet that is so strong and so powerful in your memory that you wish you had said nothing. A time to be silent. Many of you know the name of Calvin Coolidge. Calvin Coolidge was a man of very few words. As a matter of fact, he was known as Silent Cal. One day one of his friends came to him and said, Cal, I don't understand it. You see twice as many people during the course of a week than I do. I just can't get everyone in. I can't speak to everyone. And yet, through your doors, through your office, comes twice as many people as I can see. What is your secret? And Calvin Coolidge looked at him and said, The problem is, you talk back. You talk back. You see, there are times to speak, but there's a time to be silent. There is a time not to say anything. Now, here in Mark chapter 15 is a very interesting passage of Scripture. We see the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We see the Lord Jesus Christ who created the earth, who created the tongue, who created vocabulary, who created speech. Uh, we see the one here that have, could have spoken the word... And ten legions of angels would have come to his rescue. 
He could have spoke the word and his accusers would have been melted in front of him. But yet he stood before this man and these people and said nothing. I think if you'll look at this passage very closely, you'll see that what Jesus did not say said far more than what his accusers did say. Now, it takes a wise man to know when to be silent. It takes a wise woman to know when to be silent. And sometimes God can use silence to prick the heart of others and to use it as a powerful tool for the glory of God, sometimes more than other words. Uh, Sometimes silence speaks more than words. Now, think with me. There are times of admiration when silence says far more than applause. Applause is out of place. Uh, Words will not be found to express. For instance, it might be a soloist. It might be a trio. And they are singing a song that so honors the Lord that so glorifies His name, that so moves your heart and moves your soul, that when they are through with their number, you can't say amen, you can't clap. All you can do is just sit there and admire how God has used that individual and used His vocal cords and has used His talent for the glory of God. When I was in college at Tennessee Temple, I visited, of course, in Highland Park Baptist Church. The Highland Park Baptist Church had a trio called the Ladies' Trio. I knew all three of the ladies. They were wives of deacons and pastors in the church. I knew their lives. I knew the way that they lived. They had such a haunting melody and a love for the Lord that when they sang, I never said amen. I never clapped. I never did any of that. I just sat there in awe, thanking God for the talent and the spirituality and the power of that song. And so sometimes, through admiration, we just simply sit and we don't say anything. It might be an illustration that a speaker would give. It might be a powerful message brought to you by a preacher uh, of the Word of God. But sometimes in the area of admiration, we're just simply silent. Maybe sometimes in the area of contempt, silence is best. I can remember as a boy doing some very foolish things. And saying some very foolish things. And I can remember that at times my dad would say something and my dad would correct me. But the times that did the most for me was when my dad would just simply look at me. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Or your mother would just simply look at you. And they didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to go get a hickory. They didn't have to get a belt. They didn't have to do anything. Uh, you just simply uh, couldn't say anything. There was that look of contempt. A silence which shows that a thing is not worth noting. Isn't that amazing? And that happens sometimes. And I think that's what's taking place here in this passage of Scripture. Uh, Most of you know Sue and I just came back from a little vacation and we were on a cruise ship. And the cruise director the last night was talking about the voyage and so forth. And she said, a a lady came up to her and said, "Uh, Linda, does the crew sleep on this ship? Now think about that for a moment. She She said, I didn't say anything. And then I said to her, well, can you just picture looking out over the boat of a morning and here's 950 people in little rowboats trying to catch up with the ship. Of course they sleep. On board, they sleep in the in the ship, and she said at first she just looked at her and didn't know how to respond. Of course, uh, they sleep on the ship. Uh, sometime in the area of fear, shameful silence. We've done something, and we know that we've hurt someone. We know that we've shamed someone. We know that we've said something that has cut them, and just the way they look at us tells us that we've said the wrong thing, that we're not correct, that we're not right. Then, sometimes in the area of tragedy, silence is the thing to do. Last night in Miami, we'd gotten through security and we'd walked down 
uh, to the gate C5 where we were to catch our plane uh, and to come back home. And I was sitting there waiting. And I looked down uh, the corridor. And uh, here come a lady pushing a young man in a wheelchair. He looked to be about 12 years of age, completely bald-headed. And I watched as the mother helped the boy up, picked him up bodily, and moved him from one wheelchair to the wheelchair they were going to take him into the plane with and set him down. And then they wheeled him in. We got on the plane and took off, and we were in the sky, and when... The fasten the seatbelt sign came off. The mother came to the seat where the boy was sitting and picked him up bodily, and he had no movement, it seemed, and stood him up against the seat. And here's what she would do. She would pick one arm up. She would pick the arm up, and she would move it up and down like that. And then move this other arm up and down. And then she would move his head back and forth. And she would move with him. He could do nothing without his mother. And the thing that impressed me was everything she was doing was a look of love. A smile. Saying to that 12-year-old boy, about 12 years of age, I love you, I care for you. There are things you cannot do. And I felt probably that he was dying. And a tragic situation... Now, what do you do? Would you go up and say something to the mother? Would you go up and say something to the young man? I don't think so. I don't think any words that you could say uh, would be appropriate. And I just sat there, and I just felt that nothing could be said. Now, let's come back to Mark chapter 15. Look at verse 3 again. Verse 2. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered and said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of, now notice this, many things. Now think for just a moment. Have you ever been accused of anything? And maybe you were guilty. Or maybe you were not. And here is Jesus, of whom the Bible says, the evil one is coming and has nothing in me. He is the spotless Lamb of God. He is the sinless Lamb of God. Here is love personified. Here is mercy personified. And He is accused of many things. What would you have done? What would you have expected Jesus to do had you been there on that day? Answer the accusations. Point a finger at those that were accusing him. Making true remarks about them because they were sinners. And yet the Bible says he answered nothing. In verse 4, Pilate asked him again saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing. So that Pilate marveled. I marvel too. But here is the Son of God, and he understands that this is a time for silence. Now put down a few things with me, if you will, concerning this passage of Scripture. Number one, put down the silence of innocence. The silence of innocence. How do you react when you're accused falsely? We don't like to be accused even if we're guilty. But none of us like to be accused falsely. That rubs against human nature in a real mean fashion, doesn't it? For someone to stand up and point a finger at you and accuse you of not many things, but many things, it is not a pleasant situation. But listen very carefully. Sometimes the way we respond to that accusation will set the stage for the rest of our life. That will set the stage for our feelings and our emotions. That will set the stage of whether we might win over an enemy or not. To set the stage to whether we might have a friend or not. 
It's very important how we react to accusations. And here is Jesus, the sinless Son of God, innocent, guiltless, and does not respond. I can look back over my life, and I think you can too. Before I knew better, that when I was accused, the very first thing that I wanted to do was to answer and to prove. I've learned since that sometimes there's absolutely nothing you can do because there's some people that's going to form opinions of you no matter whether you're guilty or not guilty. And so sometimes, even if you're innocent as Jesus is here of the accusation, maybe the very best thing to do would just to be silent and let God take care of it. We can learn some great lessons from Jesus here. Take your Bible and turn to Proverbs chapter 11 and look at verse 12. The book of Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 12. Here's a very potent passage of Scripture. Look at verse 11 and verse 12, or verse 12 and verse 13, I'm sorry, of Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11 and look at verse 12. He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor. But a man of understanding holdeth his peace. There's a great lesson in this passage of Scripture. Watch what he says. He that is void of wisdom. The word void there is empty and wasteful. If I want to live a life that is empty, if I want to live a life that is wasteful, then I go around speaking when I should not speak, accusing others when I should not accuse, and despising others. And the word despise there means to make light of. To make light of. I look at this congregation this morning and I feel that most of you want to be men and women of wisdom. I feel like that most of you this morning probably want to be a man or a woman of spirituality. So learn the lesson that Jesus is teaching us here. That if you want to go through life empty and void and wasteful, then speak when you shouldn't speak. Run down others before you get all the details. And by the way, the Bible says at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And sometimes we form opinions just because what people say or what we see. And sometimes what we see is not really what we're seeing. And we need to be very, very careful. And so Jesus says, uh, don't waste your life. Don't be void of wisdom. If you do, you despise your neighbor. But watch. But a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Here is the prudent silence of the wise. I think we could say that of Jesus, couldn't we? The prudent silence of the wise. Sometimes I'm not very wise. But I want to be. And I would certainly like to live this scripture out. Now look at verse 13. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth a matter. Here is sincerity, here is wisdom, and here is faithfulness. Now back to Mark chapter 15. The silence of innocence. Watch now. As Jesus stood before this man, here's what you see. You see him as he stands in the garbs of holy character. Holy character really doesn't need to speak. It is already spoken. If you look at the life of Jesus as he walked upon the face of the earth, no man could lay an accusation upon him. There was nothing in his life to take hold of. And that's where the Bible tells us that we should live. Live in such a way that there's nothing in our life that Satan can take hold of. Now, we're not perfect, of course. And we're not sinless, of course. But we ought to live in such a way that there's nothing in our life that Satan can take hold of. What's in my life today? What's in your life today that Satan can take hold of? And so Jesus stands before this man and the others in the garbs of holy character. 
And His life is already spoken and is speaking now and it speaks more than words. You see, Jesus is going to let the charges refute themselves. And uh, the answer is given, of course, in His life. So the silence of innocence. Secondly, notice the silence of confidence. Boy, it's a great thing to go through life with confidence, isn't it? When you go through life uncertain, when a man or a woman goes through life hoping that they're saved, if I just, if I hope I will make it, I hope I'm good enough, I hope that my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, and I hope at the end of the way that I'll hear the Savior say, Enter in, you've lived a good life. That's an awful, terrible way to live, isn't it? An awful way to live. I don't want to go through life. I want to know that I'm saved, that I'm uh, on my way to heaven. And I know that as a result of the Word of God. Amen? You know that? I hope you do. I pray that you do. But it's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing to go through life not knowing whether you're in the will of God or not. Well, I hope that I'm in the place that God's called me, that I'm serving Him. I hope that I'm uh, in, the, in the center of His will, the perfect center of His will. And then it's a very awful, difficult thing to go through life just not sure. Just not sure. And what, I, what am I doing? Is it right? Am I making any difference? Am I really making any difference in this world that I live in? Or am I just passing through? I'm not really sure where I came from. I'm not really sure where I'm going. I don't really know about today. I'm just passing through. I get up in the morning. I shave. I shower. I, I take care of the personal hygiene. I go to my job. I, I don't know whether I make a difference at work or not. Uh, my family's around me. I'm not really sure I'm making a difference there. I'm just living. I'm just traveling through. What an awful way to live. But here is Jesus walking upon the face of the earth and walking with confidence. He doesn't need to say anything because of innocence. He doesn't need to say anything because of confidence. First of all, He's confident in His Father's will. He came to die. Born to die up on Calvary. And Jesus knew the accusations would come. He knew the accusations would be there. He knew that He would be falsely accused. And not by one or two people, but by many. And not a few accusations, but by many. But He knows that He's innocent, that He's the Son of God, and He knows that He's in the will of His Father. What confidence that is. Hebrews says of Jesus, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Let me pause a moment and say something. Young people, young adults, young singles, young marriage, just starting out in life. Listen, there are many adults in this building this morning that if they could, they would rise and they would say to you, Don't make the mistakes that I made. Find the will of God for your life at an early age and do it. Do it. I had a preacher say to me, and I don't know how to put this so you won't misunderstand. He said to me, Brother Boofer, sometimes... I'm really not sure whether my ministry is successful or not. I know God's called me to do this and that and the other thing. But if I just had a church like you, Pastor, and know that something's being done through that church. He said, I'm not sure of that. And I thought, man, that's, that's an awful way to live. There are adults in this building this morning that would love to go back and make some changes. Young people, don't make that mistake. You find the will of God for your life now and you do it. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Now, you'll not be perfect. 
You'll make your mistakes. You'll have your ups and downs. But you stay in the will of God no matter which way the wind blows. No matter what people say. No matter what comes your way. You find the will of God and you do it. Again, not only was he confident in his father's will, but he was confident that the father would deal with the injustice. You know, I might look at a young man like I described to you a few moments ago. And I might look at him and I might say, what a waste. Why did God allow that? I might look at that young mother and I might say, you know, she could be doing other things. But I don't know why God has placed that young man here or that lady here. It may be one day at the judgment seat of Christ that that young fellow and that sweet mother will receive from the hands of God riches that they would have never comprehended. You, listen, if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, you will be falsely accused. There will be people that won't like you. There will be people that will say things. And you know what? You really can't do much about it. People are going to feel the way they want to feel and say what they want to say. And you go around and you try to put this fire out and that fire out, you'll go crazy. But you know something? If you're in the will of God and you know you're right with God, then just let God handle it. He'll handle all the injustices in the world. He'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. God's still on the throne. Amen? He's there for you. He's there for me. And Jesus knew that His Father would take care of every injustice. He knew that His Father would work everything out for His glory. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. What a great thought that is for the child of God. What a great thought that is for me. And a great thought that that is for you. Then notice thirdly, the silence of royalty. I have a question for you. Who was before whom here? Huh? No, it was not Jesus that was on trial. It was... Humanity that was on trial. Here is the test, listen to me. Here is the test of true spiritual condition. It was Jesus who was perfect. It was Jesus who was all loving. And it was Jesus who was giving forth the best testimony. I think I've told you this a few times, but this fits perfectly here, I think. Just let you think about it. My hero, one of my heroes is Dr. Lee Robertson. You know that. He's still, he's 95 years old, still preaching. Although his health now is really deteriorating. And and he's not able to drive anymore, and that really hurts him. He drove, at 93, 94, he drove everywhere he went. Now they've taken that away from him, and that's, that's hurt him. But he still preaches in in different places. One of the greatest men of God I've ever known in my entire life. One of the most compassionate men I've ever met in my entire life. One of the strongest men that I've ever met in my entire life. Dignified. And there was a time that a university, a Christian university, in their periodicals and on their radio station were accusing him of certain things because he had some speech. And Dr. Robertson was always his own man. He would invite to speak in his pulpit whom he wanted to speak in the pulpit. He didn't worry about who was here or there or what was being said. If a man was a godly man, he had him to speak. And he was criticized for that. And he would never give an answer and never give a rebuke. And someone said to him, Doctor, Dr. Robertson, why is it that you do not answer these accusations? Here was his answer. I want to keep myself sweet. Pretty good answer. Amen? I want to keep myself sweet. What a testimony. I know I'm not going to be able to please everybody. I know I'll not be able to verify everything, and so I'll just let God handle it, and I'm going to go on and serve God. Pretty good theology. Amen? You see, you never know who's watching. And then there's the silence of judgment. They had refused to listen. He had preached before them. He had performed miracles before them. 
He had fulfilled Old Testament prophecy right before their very eyes. Everything He did, everything He said, fulfilled Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah, and all of that spoke for His self. They were being judged by His life. And He stands there before them. And as He stands before them, He is judging them. They had hardened their heart many times. Over and over and over and over and over again. He refused to cast His pearls before swines. And as He stood there, He is the judge. They are the accused. They are found guilty. And then lastly, think about the silence of fulfillment. Go back to Isaiah 53. The book of Isaiah chapter 53. Here's one of the great classic old time scriptures, Old Testament scriptures of our Savior. I don't have time to read all of them. But look at verse 7. Isaiah 53 and verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shares is done. So he openeth not his mouth. Watch now. He is a person of worth and dignity under the most degrading circumstances. Now I want you to get that. He is a person of worth and dignity in the most degrading of circumstances. Only a man or a woman who walks with God can say that, can experience that, I probably should say. And so I want to ask myself a question this morning, and I want you to ask yourself a question this morning. Do we know when to be quiet? Do we know when to be silent? Now, do not misunderstand. The Bible says, speak the truth in love. Nothing wrong with speaking the truth in love. But sometimes, even when speaking the truth in love is appropriate, silence is even more appropriate. Keep your words sweet. You may have to eat them. Quickly, there was a little boy that would get angry and would say things that he should not say. It got so bad that the father knew he had to do something to get the boy's attention. So he told the boy, he said, there's a post outside the house. And every time you get angry and every time you say things you shouldn't say, we're going to take a nail and we're going to nail it into the post. And pretty soon that post was completely filled with nails. Finally, the little boy got the message. Daddy, you mean that represents all the people that I've hurt, all the bad things that I've said? Well, that's not right, Daddy. I'm going to change my way. And the dad said, all right. Every time I see you act appropriately, every time I see you act correctly, we're going to take one nail out. Finally, the day came that all the nails, the last nail was removed from the post. The little boy danced around in glee. And the father said, well, son, I'm so proud of you, but just remember the holes are still there. Just remember the holes are still there. That's a good lesson for you and me and all of us. There's a time to be silent. Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed, please? Brother Hill is going to lead the choir in a song of invitation. Now listen carefully. If you'll just remain silent and quietly for just a few moments, we'll be...